Hello everyone and welcome back to Gay Chill Crafts. I'm Sarah and this week, as promised, I have some follow-up uh, reporting on some more natural dye experiments that I've been doing. And today I wanted to specifically talk about um, Black Eyed Susans as a dye. Um, so these are a common yellow flower. I think they grow over most parts of North America. Um, they certainly grow very well um, here in Vermont in the uh, northeastern United States where we are. Um, and in fact they grow so well. Um, I had a bed of calendula flowers last year that I had intentionally planted and they did very well and at the end of that growing season I intentionally left some seed heads on the flowers so that they could reseed themselves and I kind of encouraged them by you know um, breaking up the dried seed heads so that the seeds would go into the soil in that uh, area and thought I had done a really great job of uh, propagating all of that until the spring what I thought were calendula plants ended up blooming and I, I have a whole bed of Black Eyed Susans. Um, so a little disappointed because calendula was the thing I was going after but the, the cool thing is the Black Eyed Susans um, can be used for a dye and it's a dye color that I haven't been able to achieve uh, up until this point. Um, so that's always exciting when you're trying a new a new technique or a new color source and then you end up with a nice color. Um, so I'll go ahead and show you these and then talk about them. Now on my screen they're looking very washed out, um, but in person, and I'll try to do some color correction on the video um, to get it a little bit closer or maybe I'll just put in a picture. Um, but in person these are a lovely celery green color. So like I was saying, it is a light green, um, but it's definitely more saturated um, than it may appear to you. And I'm very pleased with this color. Um, it's, I think, a very wearable shade of green. Um, it almost has a slight blue undertone to it, and uh, it's a nice soft color. So it would also look good with other colors or perhaps um, as a background for some color work or something like that. Um, and you'll notice that there's two different kinds of wool and, and they're definitely different in um, sort of depths of, depth of shade. Um, so I'll talk about why in just a second, but just to compare them side by side. So this one is a super wash um, yarn base. This is a commercial um, yarn base that I use um, just if I want sock yarn or if I'm teaching classes, it's a, a, an easy one to work with. Um, and this does is merino nylon, so it does have some nylon in it. And then this one is um, Shetland wool, and it's a two ply. It's a bit rustic, it's a bit thick and thin. Um, and this is mill spun yarn that is from our own flocks. So this is our sheep's wool um, in this skein. And this is the, the yarn base that I've been using for most of my natural dye experiments. I always like to throw in two skeins of this. Um, and the idea is that I'll have, at the end of all of my natural dye experiments, or when I run out of the space, um, I'll have a nice catalog or, or rainbow of different colors. And, uh, you know, we'll be able to put them all into a shawl or something. Um, I have so much of this, though, that I'm starting to accumulate. I'm thinking about selling some of it. So um, if you're interested in naturally dyed yarns, uh, leave a comment below and let me know. Um, I might be... I don't know if I'll list them online. I might just be bringing them to an upcoming um, show. We have a couple of shows in the fall. So anyway, back to, to dyeing. So um, Black Eyed Susans are pretty easy to dye with. They're that uh, fairly standard method that I've talked about on the channel before. Um, you do need to pick a lot of dye stuff in order to get enough to dye you know, several skeins of yarn. Um, for this particular experiment, I had about half of a die kettle full, so about half of a four gallon pot. Um, I guess that would be two gallons of flowers. Um, that's kind of a weird way to measure them, but um, basically just picking as many as you can. Um, now keeping in mind, and this is something I tell the students in my dye classes, um, you know, you don't want to take all of, of a certain kind of plant from a specific area when you're harvesting. Um, so if you were to go into a field or especially if you were going into an uncultivated um, meadow or forest or, or any other kind of landscape, the rule of thumb is you only wanna take about five to 
of any plant material out of that landscape so that you're not making a big footprint and you're not um, affecting adversely affecting the ecological balance by removing too much of a certain species. Um, but in this case, because this was a bed of flowers that I had planted, you know, I don't, I don't feel about harvesting most or all of those. Um, the bees and the other pollinators do get a chance to visit the flowers before I pick them, so they are still getting some benefit. And then um, there's lots of other wildflowers in our front pastures and our surrounding, uh, kind of the clearing around our house. Um, so I know I'm not affecting them too much, but that's just the difference between, you know, harvesting on either somebody else's property or, or wild landscape versus harvesting uh, maybe a bed of something that you've planted intentionally. Um, so you have your half your half uh, dye vat full of flowers, and of course um, to that you would add warm water and then bring that up to temperature. Uh, when I don't know the specific properties of, of dye plants or dye material, I tend not to go over 180. Um, 180 degrees Fahrenheit in my temperature when I'm extracting the dye just because you don't want to overcook your color. Um, some plants like matter like a, like an even lower temperature. Like for rose matter, I don't go above 150 um, because it will turn in just sort of a muddy brown color. Um, but the black-eyed Susan seem to be quite forgiving, um, just like goldenrod, you know, they give up their color right away. And um, I would say that they achieve a fairly saturated dye vat. I was able to dye 300 grams of yarn um, just with maybe maybe one or two hundred grams of picked flowers. So that's a fairly low ratio for, for a decent saturation of color um, for fresh dye plants versus the amount of yarn that I put in. Now I did mention um, that you know the two dye bases the, or the two wool bases that I used each picked up the color differently and I think there's a couple of reasons for that um, so I'll talk about that so one of the reasons is that I thought that my Shetland yarn had been mordanted previously but it had not so when I put the wool into the dye bath the superwash immediately started changing color and taking on the color whereas this just sat there and it, when I pulled it out it still looked like undyed yarn. Um, so what I did at that point is that I took all of the yarn out of the color vat and then I put this this yarn into a mordant vat and went ahead and mordanted it then and there and then ended up dyeing it afterwards. Now the reason I took all of the yarn out was that if you think about dye molecules, individual dye molecules floating around in a vat as magnetic particles, and then think of your mordanted yarn as a magnet that those little particles are going to get stuck onto, right? If I left a mordanted skein in the dye vat for a longer period of time and then added this yarn later, this yarn would have gotten much more saturated. And I didn't want to use up all of the dye molecules that I had in my dye vat on a single skein of yarn. So I didn't, in other words, I didn't want this one skein to get much darker and then leave almost no dye for the other skeins that I wanted to um, try out with this dye method. So I pulled all three out um, the superwash skein was already kind of the shade that it ended up being, um, so I left that one to the side. I mordanted the Shetland yarn, the two skeins of Shetland, and that process took about an hour, an hour and a half. And then from the mordant vat, I just squeezed out those skeins and put them right back into the, um, the vat that I was using with the Black Eyed Susans. And... Um, I had left the flowers in the vat. Now I don't often like to leave the plant material in the vat because it will get tangled up into the yarn. But in this case, because I had almost messed up in the beginning, I wanted to make sure that I was allowing as much dye as possible to come out of those flowers that I was using. So one way to do that is to leave the plant material in the vat with your yarn while you're dyeing it. And I don't know if that made a massive difference, 
but I certainly did get a nice color on both skeins of the Shetland in the end. Um, so that was great. Another thing that I did is that I, after the Shetland yarn had had a chance to take on the color of the Black Eyed Susans, I um, turned the flame off and let them sit in there for a while and I put this yarn back in um, just to make sure that all three skeins were going to get a nice long sort of marinating time in the warm dye vat with the flowers and make sure that they could take on as much of the color as possible. And so I did leave that dye vat to rest overnight and cool down very slowly. Um, that's another tip that I have for you in general when dyeing. Um, both with acid dyes, but especially with botanical dyes, is to really take your time um, heating and cooling things, and that gives the, the dye extra time to work. Um, you'll read, you know, tip sheets and things in older books on dye, and they talk about coaxing color out of plants, or, you know, allowing things to rest and all of this, and it is very much that kind of slow process. Um, and for someone like me who likes to see results right away, it can be kind of frustrating. But I have had much better results, especially with natural dyes, when I take my time, I heat things gently, or I allow them to sit an extra day, or I allow them to cool down for extra time. Whatever step you're on, just letting it play out slowly over time rather than trying to rush and you know, then expect great results and you end up with blotchy yarn or um, maybe yarn that doesn't take up the color that, the way that you had expected. So after I had allowed the dye vat to cool down overnight, I did take the skeins out. I gave them a quick rinse. The, um, the dye vat still had some color in it, but not much. And the skeins didn't bleed out um, when I rinsed them. So that was a really good sign. I just had to kind of um, get the plant material out. <clears throat> One more tip I'll give you about dyeing uh, with natural plant material. If you do have to leave the plant matter in the vat and it gets all tangled up into your yarn, like you have, you know, leaves and twigs and flowers and things, rather than trying to pick those out individually or, um, you know, trying to get rid of it when the yarn is wet, wait until the yarn is completely dry. Then you can just take the whole chain and give it a really good uh, shake. And that will get rid of most of the dye matter um, very easily. Wet yarn tends to hold on to everything, but dry yarn tends to kind of let go of stuff. So quick tip for you there. Um, I'm very pleased with this color. Like I said, I'm hoping that I can adjust this video so that the color will show up um, as it reads in person, um, but I'm very happy with it. Now, one thing that was interesting to me was that these uh, skeins of Shetland um, took on the color a little bit less evenly than the Superwash, and there's almost some darker spots where you can see that there were flowers resting on the yarn. Um, I'll try to get a good close-up and put it in here. So you get these darker, slightly more saturated um, and more bluey green uh, strands or sections. Um, and I think that's from where the flower heads were actually resting on the yarn versus other sections where it was just the dye water. Um, and I really like that, that uh, effect. It adds a lot of depth to the color and the yarn. It's not so different that it would interfere with a pattern, but it just gives it a nice richness that, you know, if you looked at that and you said, oh, that's hand dyed or that's handmade um, in some way, or it just has a nice visual look to it. Um, so that was kind of a, a happy accident based on my, again, almost messing it up in the first place. Um, and something, to, again, to look out for, you know, if you're trying to make speckled yarn or yarn with uh, different tonal qualities, that's actually one technique that you can use is to lay the plant matter right onto the yarn and allow some areas to get darker than others. Um, in this case, it's just a subtle change, um, but it still adds a nice visual texture. The other interesting thing is just that the, 
the color does register as darker on the superwash skein, and I don't know if that's just because it was in first and mordanted, and like I said, it sucked up more dye molecules. Um, I also have a feeling that just that different bases in general take on color differently. And, you know, superwash yarn, because it's been treated um, and manipulated a lot, washed multiple times, um, and the scales are laying flat inside of the skein, or, 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 sorry, the scales on each particular strand of wool are, are laying flatter. Um, I think it's just much more sponge-like, and so it tends to suck up color and suck up liquids uh, much more readily than an untreated wool, um, which is going to have all the scales. Um, this has probably been handled and washed a lot less in total than the superwash, and so it tends to over-dye you know, less saturated than the superwash. Um, and that's another reason for kind of being slow about, about working with untreated yarns and taking your time is that they just, for some reason, the color just needs more time and care and, and a softer touch to really adhere to the wool. But like I said, I'm very pleased with how both of these came out and um, I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna do with them but I may keep some of this and again, I may have some of it for sale in the future, or I might do bundles, you know, natural dye bundles for shawls or something like that. So again, if you have any interest in these, um, leave me a note in the comments and let me know. Um, yeah, and if you have uh, any questions or if you are trying uh, natural dyeing with Black Eyed Susans, I would love to hear your comments. Um, I'll talk about them a little bit more in a couple of weeks when I talk about eco-printing onto sock blanks, which is another thing that we did in a recent dye class, and it was a lot of fun, and um, the colors we got were so good that I decided to eco-print a whole bunch more of these sock blanks. And so I'll talk about that process and the differences um, in color that you can get between um, cattle dyeing with plants versus doing this eco-printing process. Um, in future episodes. So stay tuned for that. And again, let us know how you're getting on with your summer and what projects you're working on. And uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe and the notification button to let, it, to let you know when we have new videos up. They generally come out on Mondays every week. And thanks again for joining me. Uh, have a great week. Enjoy your projects, whatever you're working on, and we'll see you next time. Cheers.